You're listening to The Hustle Podcast with Justin Harrison. Look, I don't have an issue with budgeting. I've been following your, your podcast and some of your, your reviews. Budgeting and controlling my fan, finances is not my issue. But what I do have is, um, you know, the question is, how do we find financial freedom? And to everybody, financial freedom is something different. For me specifically, it's, you know, the stresses of, you know, your tax, um, is your tax being overtaxed type of thing. You know, the, you always read the narrative, you know, the, we've been taxed on fuel, we've been taxed on your salary, you've been taxed on groceries. Everything seems to be a tax. And if you really, I mean, rough mathematics will tell you that the, the average person is taxed close to about 70% on average of your, your income. And that scares, that scares anyone. It scares me, it scares everyone else, I'm sure. And then the other thing, part and parcel of that uh, financial freedom is will we be given uh, you know, an equal opportunity from your kids' perspective? You know, uh, you hear in the universities, you know, the selection is, you know, the B uh, progression is quite high and people are being limited into varsity, that kind of thing. So, uh, you know, from investment, you're not just investing in yourself, you're investing in your family, in the country. Is it a good investment to be investing in the country? That's sort of my question, number one. So I think there's so many relevant points that you add, and I think this is probably the conversation around every middle class dinner table at the moment, right? And uh, taxation is a huge issue, and I talk about this on repeat because I think the middle class really needs to understand that we are the ones paying the taxes. The wealthy don't pay tax, or they pay very limited amounts of taxation. The poor obviously are entirely dependent on the middle class structures for for their grants and for everything that uh, comes for free from government. So the middle class is being taxed into poverty at the moment. And it's what I like to refer to as middle class poverty. And uh, the reality of it is, like you said, maybe 70%. I mean, we've done our calculations actually about 85% because people are not taking into account the non-taxable things that you're actually already paying tax for. For example, you've got private security. Why have we got private security? Well, because the police force is ineffective. Why have we got private medical aids? Well, because the government can't provide a decent hospital for us to go to. So the real rates of taxation is more than what you just pay in terms of income tax. And then there's another thing that people are not thinking about, which is a opportunity cost because remember a large portion of your income is going to taxation which means that's money that you can't use to build wealth and so that's an opportunity cost so the real taxation is actually a lot higher than people think so very valid conversation also the question of course on everybody's mind who's in the middle class is you know what does financial freedom look like first of all and secondly is there a future in this country so let's just quickly unpack financial freedom because as you said it means a lot of things to different people but really it actually is only one thing financial freedom is the ability to wake up and no longer have to work for money and this is the missing part of the equation so you might be a high income earner that doesn't make you financially free. If you're a high income earner, it just means that you have purchasing parity. It does not mean that you're financially free. So we have to understand that financial freedom is about creating vehicles of income, whether that be through investing or creating businesses that are relatively passive to produce income that isn't earned. And that really is the closest thing towards financial freedom, right? The second thing to understand is that there is only one answer to this for the middle class. You know, as much as we want to focus on reducing taxation, taxation is unfortunately almost impossible to avoid. I mean, you can reduce it. There's a lot of things you can do to reduce it. And I have loads of examples that people can implement immediately. But one of the things that you need to focus on is building in diversity into your income. If you are entirely dependent on one source of income or two sources of income or one country of income or one currency of income or one asset class of income. This is always going to be a risky, a risky bet. And so when I talk about building foundational wealth, it is about diversifying your income. You're far better off having, for example, five sources of income at 20,000 rand a month than one source of income at 100,000 rand a month. And this is really the thing that the middle class needs to start focusing in on. And there's a lot of ways to achieve that. There's a lot of vehicles to get there. But I think the idea that you have to get your head around is that really the key is diversity. As to your question around the future of South Africa and, of course, the stability issues here and all the things that we as the middle class like to talk about and worry about and concern ourselves with, here's the bottom line. There is no country on earth that provides a perfect environment. It's simply a case of using a weighing machine and figuring out where you get treated best for specific things. And we'll get into a deeper part of that conversation, I think, as we go into this uh, into the session, because you've you probably got more questions around this. But 
I think it's important to understand that your risks are infinitely increased by not being diversified. And that stems to every aspect, whether it be taxation, whether it be income, whether it be where you educate your kids, whether it's how many passports you hold, all of these things is about risk and diversification. And so when I talk to the middle class about building wealth, I always say, look, your biggest asset is earned income. Because earned income is what's going to get you to the non-earned income. And so it's very important, as you said, you're really good at budgeting all of that. But it's really important to understand how to allocate the extra monies you have in order to build up diversity. And so, you know, I think for the, for the middle class, the obvious one to start looking at is taxation. If you're employed currently, I would highly consider looking at a contracting agreement between yourself and the company because you can register a business, you can claim a lot of things that you wouldn't be able to claim in your personal capacity and thereby reducing your taxation. If you are self-employed already or you perhaps have a business, there's a lot of things you can do in terms of structures. To You can't do away with tax completely, but you can highly, highly, highly limit the amount of tax you pay. And this is why I say the value of having a good accountant, more specifically, actually a tax consultant, is worth its weight in gold. And not a lot of people want to spend money on tax consultants because they see it purely as an expense. But the truth of it is a tax consultant is there to save you money. And I can tell you I've spent the last nine years disinvesting from this country. I've spent the last nine years making sure I have an internationally uh, stable portfolio and set of income. And that has given me huge peace of mind living in this country. I would be very scared if I was an individual living in this country, earning in this country, and entirely dependent on the system. And, of course, paying up a major portion of my my, my income in taxes. Sure. And I think um, to your advice, I mean, I've I've already taken steps to to do some of what what you mentioned already. I mean, from a a tax perspective of, you know, where earning, I'm already a contract. I've done done some steps to remedy that. uh, and, And, you know, that's part and parcel of what I've been doing. Also, divested into other areas of business for additional sources of income. Yeah. But I mean, uh, you know, now the next step is where do I evolution to, right? What's the next step? And I think that's the follow on to my next question, if, uh, if we can jump to that. Mm. If I have to invest in foreign markets, um, you know, in, in foreign lands, where do I begin? Because I mean, you know, you've always got this fear. You, you're not even sure what's happening in this country. How would you know what's happening in a foreign country? Like, I mean, is your investment a safe investment? I mean, do they have corn sharks and that kind of thing in those part of the world, in those borders, you know? So those are kind of fears that you have. And I think I've never been one to be um, a big risk taker. And, and, and that's my fear right now. It's how do I take the next step? Um, and, and, and I think that's, that's for me, the biggest leap is to go into the next one. Is what, what do I do? Let's put it this way. In, in this country, I've, I've invested in two other portfolios, additional two other streams beyond my salary that I earn. But it's now taking the evolution, and that's what I need assistance for. So there's a couple of things to unpack, and I think, again, you know, my outlook on investing is potentially very different from the normal financial advisor because I'm driven by completely different factors. I'm an entrepreneur. I'm a business person. I've worked really hard to acquire capital. And so for me, when I invest, I, I make a very controversial statement that not a lot of people necessarily understand, but you don't invest to make money. So what I mean by this is it's really a mindset shift. You invest to preserve capital. And when I say preserve capital, it's not about making sure your capital stays at the same amount. It means to make sure it has the same purchasing power years from now. So if you have a million rand today, because of inflation, that million rand buys you much less next year. So my first objective when I invest is not to double my money. My first objective is to make sure that the capital that I've worked so hard to acquire continues to have the same purchasing power. In other words, beat inflation through the investments. When you take that investment approach, it's a completely different way of saying, I want to go into the money markets and, and, and make money. And so I encourage people to go back to the basics of finance, which is you have to acquire the capital first. So you've got to set up as many potential income streams as possible. If you want to truly obtain financial freedom, it's not just purely about capital allocation. You've got to acquire the capital to allocate the capital. So I always say to people, knuckle down and focus a bit harder on earning more income from more sources because that's going to give you ultimately what you're looking for. Once you've got the money, now the question becomes, where do you put the money? And so with that mindset in mind, I look at asset allocation very different from everybody else. First of all, 
I don't use brokers because brokers fees, just 1% in brokerage fees over a 20 year lifespan of an investment will give you one third less on your investment over 20 years, just one percentage point. That is absolutely frightening when you think about how it, how it absolutely erodes the wealth of the middle class. And so then you have to ask yourself the question, well, if I take my money to a broker, where is the broker going to invest the money? Whether it's an onshore investment, offshore investment, have a look at where they're allocating capital to. It's the same places you can allocate it to by yourself, by self-investing and pay no fees on it, right? And so let me tell you where they allocate. They go into the top 40 stocks on the JSE. Satrix Top 40. They'll go into the S&P 500. They'll take an ETF that tracks a specific industry sector because they understand diversity is the key to a successful portfolio. They won't go and buy single stocks or single shares. Uh, if they're investing in real estate, they don't physically go and invest in the real estate. They invest into assets that underpin the real estate. So for example, they'll, in, they'll, they'll open up what is known as a real estate investment trust, as opposed to going and buying the actual physical property it has the same benefits, but without all the headache. So there's, there's a lot of things that you can literally look at what the brokerages do and just copy and paste for your own life without paying the fees, because this is exactly what a broker is going to do. And then as to your question to diversify outside of the country, I'm very well traveled, 77 countries, and I haven't gone for leisure. I've gone to build businesses. I've gone to look for plan B, C, D, E, and F if this country goes down the shitter, right? This has been the sole focus of the last 15 years of my life is building diversity into my life model. And so I can tell you that there is no perfect country on earth. There is no perfect form of governance on earth. There is no perfect currency on earth. And I can tell you, I don't have all the answers. I don't know which is the perfect asset to, to invest into. I don't know which is the perfect country to invest into. But I do know one thing with absolute certainty. The only thing that is going to safeguard the individual investor is diversity. And so you should be in multiple currencies. You should be in multiple assets. You should be in multiple markets. It's not good enough just to invest in the JSC. You should also invest in the S&P, the NASDAQ. You should also invest in potentially some of the more developing markets like India. There are lots of opportunities out there. It's just understanding how to structure your portfolio. And this is perhaps the key discussion is sitting down and understanding your stage of life. So for your stage of life, are you more on the growth spectrum or are you more on the preservation spectrum? If you're leaning more towards growth, you're obviously going to take slightly higher risks. If you're more on the preservation side, you're going to take less risk and you're going to look for capital security. And so when you go to the market with these questions in mind and knowing and understanding what your risk profile is, which you don't need a broker to do, you know where you're at. You know how long before your kids are out of school. You know how long you're going to go before retirement. If you ask yourself the question, you will have the answer. And then based on that, it comes down to how much do you allocate of your portfolio to risk and how much do you allocate your portfolio for preservation. So as an example, in my 30s, I was all risk, right? And as I've moved towards my 40s and my mid-40s and my, and my kids are sort of at their midway point, I now have got a much more conservative view on my investing. But I've also acquired the capital to be more, more conservative. So it really is about understanding what you want to get to. And then perhaps the biggest piece of advice I can give everyone, and you alluded to this in your question, is you don't know exactly which market to trust and you, you, you risk adverse. And here's the thing. Don't invest in anything you don't understand. I get people every single day who will tell me they're invested in a unit trust or they're invested in this portfolio with their broker. And I say, okay, great. What are the assets that underpin that? And they go, I don't know. My broker knows. There is the problem. You need to understand what you're invested to in the first place. And if you're not understanding it and you don't know it, don't put your money in. So if you have no idea how to value a company, if you don't understand that there is a disconnect between market cap and share price and the actual intrinsic value of a company, and you've never read a balance sheet or an income statement or a cash flow statement in your life, my advice is before you invest in a, any stock, any index, any collection of stocks, Go and acquire the knowledge on how to understand that aspect first. Because a lot of people come from a position of employment or self-employment and they haven't necessarily built businesses and they think they understand business until they undergo some financial training to actually be able to read balance sheets and income statements. Then only are you ready to actually start investing that kind of thing. If you've never owned real estate for investment purposes, 
go and acquire the knowledge first. Do some time acquiring the knowledge before you invest in any funds that are underpinned by real estate. If you don't understand commodity cycles and you don't understand the macroeconomic impact of these different commodity cycles, before you go and buy gold and silver, make sure you get acquire the knowledge first. So, you know, and this is the problem with the middle class because the middle class assumes because they've gone to school, they've done accounting at school, they've done some economics, they've read a couple of articles, they understand money. And the truth of it is the global economic cycles and the macroeconomic pictures play down directly into your individual investments and you have to understand that stuff. I think you're spot on on that, uh, on that advice. You know, that uh, we not, no one teaches you uh, when you come back from a schooling system of what to do with your money, how to invest, or economics, like you mentioned, um, understanding commodities, what happens, the life cycle of commodities, etc. I mean, you just know gold is mined from the ground and sold onto the reserves, and off, off it goes. You know, you, you invest in whatever. That the, the you know the the, the minutes going to my careers of business. That's what what we fail to to understand and realize. You know, some some of them, or well, some of us might be, you know, quick enough to snap onto that information and 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 use it to the advantage. And well and good. But for the majority, I think it's, it's understanding and how, you know, what happens next is, is, the, is what we need to grasp onto. Um, and I think that's, that's something that we all need to learn at some point. Um, you know, and, and I'm glad that you started something like this in your program because, I mean, it gives everybody an equal opportunity. And that's, that for me, you know, it's, it's uh, I'm enjoying um, the journey as well. So I'm, I've been following you for quite a while and, and following the journey. Sometimes you give snippets of advice and it's good advice and we enjoy it. And, and, I've put some of it into practice already, and that's that's where I am at my point. So yeah, thanks for that, Justin. Um, so, so the last one, obviously, uh, what I asked for is, you know, how can I make my money grow? Right? Would 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 South Africa kind of falling short right now and disappointing us on the power front, front disappointing us on the government and the way they run the country? What can I do to create? Okay, it's more or less leading to your point of number two, but a safe haven, right? So, I mean, there's no real safe haven. Everyone knows that. I mean, but if it, you kind of alluded to this in point number two, but if you had to give somebody, uh, a, a, you know, quick and nasty advice of, you know, focus on other countries or whatever it may be, what, what would that be? So first of all, I would say, again, the same thing I said earlier, diversity is your biggest insurance when it comes to wealth preservation and pretty much any sovereignty in the world. Diversity is everything. You should hold uh, residencies and potentially passports in multiple countries. You sh- and, I sa- and I lead with that one because it's one that people can relate to easiest. The second thing I would say is that in terms of money, uh, to understand that holding cash is the riskiest investment of all because you put your money in the bank account, you're not beating inflation, the real inflation, not government-quoted inflation. Uh, I like to refer to it as Woolworths inflation. If you go to Woolies uh, a year from now, I promise you it's not 5.3% or whatever government quotes at the time. It's going to be 10 to 15%. So diversity is your friend in terms of looking for a safe haven. There is no country that is a perfect safe haven. America is a mess. The UK is a mess. South Africa is a mess. Pretty much everywhere around the world is a mess right now. And it is a result of many decades of terrible financial decisions within the global economic system, which is coming down hard on the middle class globally right now. The, glo- the, the middle class in the next decade faces the biggest onslaught in recorded history in terms of erosion of purchasing power. So I think if you're asking me for what would my quick and nasty advice be, the first thing I'd say is, Think very carefully about how to generate income outside of South Africa. Because South Africa is in a serious, we're in serious trouble. We've become a net importer of just about everything. We, we have a deficit in trade, and that ultimately is going to lead to a big recession here. And a recession here, I have no question in my mind, is going to stir the masses in a way that we've never seen in our lives before. It's going to bring about real pain. And unlike a lot of countries across our borders, we have yet to truly experience a revolution in this country. And we, our people, unfortunately, don't understand the impact of the choices and the words that they're using. The other African countries are perhaps a little bit further along in their journey because they've discovered that, that pain is not where you want to be. You want to avoid those things and figure out how to make the economy grow. We, we're trying to take the same pie and slice it up till everybody's fighting over crumbs instead of putting new pies on the table. And so you have to do what our government isn't doing. You need to put more pies on the table for yourself and your family. You need to go out there, figure out how to get 
multiple streams of income outside of your current currency. That's the first thing. The second thing is as to where do you put that money? Uh, I hold the strongest opinion right now that you should not have anything more than 50% of your net worth in this country. And 50% is a very high number. I That's actually dialed up. I say 50% because I think for most middle class people, Doing anything less is, is, is going to be quite difficult because they have to live and they have to survive in this environment. But I would say for the average person, try and aim to have 50% of your money in other markets. Which other market doesn't matter. You've got to diversify and spread it around. Then I would say in terms of capital allocation, you should keep 20% of your net worth in liquidity, meaning that that's cash that's available, medium of exchange to trade and buy things and invest into something as it comes available. The remaining 80%, you should, depending on your age, depending on your, uh, your, your sort of risk of profile, you should say, okay, a portion of that should go to hard assets like gold, silver, because gold and silver are going to hold their values. No question about it. They have real tangible uses in the world. It is a store of wealth to a degree, but it isn't necessarily what I would call an investment because an investment for me does three things. It has preservation of current value. It has appreciation, future value, above the current value, and most importantly, it cash flows. It produces some utility of value. Now, gold and silver do two of those three things, but it doesn't cash flow. And that's why I like to invest into dividend stocks, because regardless of what the stock price does, regardless of what the sentiment around a company does, you continue to earn a share of profits. And so I highly recommend people have a portfolio of dividend stocks so that you share in the profits of a company irrespective of what the share price does. And so if the share price, you know, dips by 50% in the next year, it really is not going to bother you because you're earning a share of profits, provided you make sure the companies you invest into are profitable. And then after that, I would say you also want to take some of your money and invest into things like bonds in the bond markets like in south africa here we've got a thing called rsa retail bonds uh it's an investment that's underpinned by government um it's just basically a way for them to generate capital uh so they're taking capital from people and investing it on their behalf uh, and you get a really good return for it right so these are the sort of things i'd look i'd also look at alternative investments because there's a lot of alternative investments out there that are really good so for example things like crowdfunded projects crowdfunded farming uh, crowdfunded uh, businesses that are starting up. There's a lot of great alternative uh, investments out there. But in terms of the percentage allocations, it again is going to come down to your profile. How risk adverse are you? Uh, what is your stage of life? And so you need to break it down accordingly. But for me right now, my asset allocation looks like this. I've got 20% liquidity. I've got 40% in preservation type investments. And the other 40% well, actually, 30% is is trying to beat inflation pretty hard through through cash flowing uh, assets. And then 10% I've got in speculative investments. And so when I talk about speculative investments, I'm talking about things like cryptocurrency. I'm talking about early stage companies that aren't yet producing profit. So I know for a fact I'm risking that money, but that is part of my strategy to risk some money, knowing that there's a high probability I'll lose that money. So I don't lose sleep over it but I'm swinging for the fences. So that's my asset allocation right now. And if you looked at my asset allocation six years ago, it was very different to where it is right now. I had more risk in my portfolios than I currently have. And so the last piece of advice I'd give you is have a look at some of the good investment platforms out there. And I'm not talking about these Forex day trading nonsense that pops up all over the show. I'm talking about things that are presented by like Charles Schwab, Citigroup, like the institutionalized platforms that are really good, places like Interactive Brokers, you can go and create portfolios on there and invest internationally from a single portfolio. And that's the kind of thing that you should be looking to do. But there is a risk attached to that as well. Because it is so easy to invest, it almost becomes like a game, right? It's almost, it's almost like day trading in a way. And so again, I encourage you to do the foundational work first, which is to truly understand the assets, the markets that you're going into. If you're going to go into India, as an example, please make sure you understand the economics of the country. Yeah, so look, um, um, to your advice, I mean, I have, like I say, I have been listening to you, have been doing, it's very similar. Some, I've been making notes while I've been chatting to you, so, so to, to remember some of these things, right? Because, I mean, 
the problem I have, or I'm speaking me specifically here, is I've done a lot of investment in this country. I haven't done anything out of, and and this is my journey now. It's to now start looking outside. Very much like you, I'm in a journey or stage in my life where I'm not risk adverse. I'm more cautious in the way I want to do things. So I do want to spread my portfolio out out of this country a bit more, but be more cautious in in my approach. So listening to you, I'm, I've been noting what I need to do and how I need to look at this slightly differently from what I've been doing uh, in the past. And uh, yeah, it's time to to step up a gear, I think, for myself and and start making a change. But um, if you, if I look at what you said, I mean, you, you've done twenty percent cash, forty percent preservation, the, you know, crowd funded and and resource intensive uh, areas that you've invested in. I think those are the areas I need to follow suit, right? I mean, it it makes sense. It's it's just that you, again, you when when you, when you think you always think twice and you you, you second guess yourself. Is this a right move? But when you hear it from somebody else who has done it, I think it kind of also motivates you to a certain extent to, you know, go and do this research, go and understand what's going on. There's more more out there. And, and that's that's my stage right now is where I am at right now. And for that, I have to thank you for that because, I mean, you've opened the front pair of spectacles for me. So that's, that's for me in, in a positive side for me. Absolute pleasure. In uh, this season, we have focused in on people's personal finance questions. In the next season, we've got some really exciting stuff coming up. We're going to be focusing on small businesses. So if you are enjoying the hustle, please make sure that you hit that subscribe or follow button so that you never miss any of our future episodes. And also, please leave us a rating on your favorite podcasting app. This episode was brought to you by MoneyTribe21.com. If you enjoyed this episode, be sure to follow and subscribe on your favorite podcast platform.